Okay, everybody, we're here with Ned Thanhauser, the uh, filmmaker. Um, we just saw the Ray, uh, Ray Tauscher story. And uh, wow, Ned, you really did your homework on this one, didn't you? Yeah, thanks. I was really lucky to have the resources that showed up um, halfway into looking into this activity. The, the story behind how this film came about is uh, kind of interesting. Um, my wife and I are both avid motorcyclists, and um, we belong to a club. And our club historian um, had started research on Ray Tauscher. And in 2010, he passed away, unfortunately. And we helped his widow clean out his uh, belongings. And my wife, unknowns to me, had um, uh, took home to her office a banker box full of research materials that this fellow had done. And uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020, she pulled this box out and put it in front of me. And being a filmmaker, she said, look at this, and a motorcyclist. And I said, okay, I'm hooked. And so I ended up going to um, Ancestry.com and putting together a family tree for Ray. I mean, you know, there's lots of stuff available. And um, I found one of Ray's two, uh, actually two families of Ray's surviving family. And they had original materials. The, the box that I had had Xerox copies. So I had original materials. And you saw some of that in the documentary, the scrapbooks, uh, original newspaper articles, his racing vests, uh, that, that uh, winning banner from Australia, and a number of other items. And that allowed me to put together a timeline of his history. And uh, my son, who uh, at the time was a a photojournalist for a TV station, uh, he said, gee, that looks interesting. He got involved and he helped add a lot of value to it. So, um, yeah, I was really lucky and blessed to have all of this material. And then the challenge became, how do you tell the story? And after some period of time, I decided to do the story by telling it in first person as if Ray was telling his story. I mean, you know, I was thinking about having, you know, a voiceover you know, talking about Ray in the third person, but um, we thought it'd be kind of interesting to do it in first person. I have a voice artist uh, that you heard in the film uh, vocalize Ray's history that we wrote a script for. So that's kind of the story of how the film was made. Plus you couldn't get Morgan Freeman to do the third person <laughs> narration, right? Uh, no, that was a uh, very, very, uh, that, you beat me to the punch there. That was very effective and it really, really personalized it. Uh, yeah. our, our friend, uh, Chris from the uh, Overly Honest Movie Review, if you can see it, he has in the chat section, a really nice comment to, to that effect as well. Um, and some other yeah. really wonderful things about your film. Uh, <laughs> and I, I am, I am uh, old enough to appreciate all those clippings uh, that you show, not just for visual effect, but I'm sure you just poured over those uh, for hours upon hours. Well, there, there were pages and pages and pages. This guy had a clipping service, Ray, had a clipping service that would, you know, read newspapers and send him a clip that mentioned his name. And uh, there were two scrapbooks um, that we had that must have had 50 pages that were pasted, all these articles, one on top of the other, you know, all kind of cut in so they fit like a Tetris puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were able to scan those in and from those, we were able to put together a timeline um, and pick out the major events in his life. Again, 1931 was his, you know, his perfect year when he won the four championships. Yes. Um, I imagine on that note, um, one of the challenges is since, uh, it, you, you, you know, you don't get to meet the man, but it's all through... Um, clippings which cut to the chase the news item of the day which right. is he made such and such time he won the event but how did he how do you parse that with the man himself and getting into what he was like as a person well there were some articles that actually talked about uh, especially the local oregonian newspaper here in portland uh, i'm in portland and that makes it a nice portland story um there were some articles that talked about what the humble man he was and then when we were able to find some of his surviving family members that knew him firsthand, and you saw two of them, uh, uh, two families at the end of the film and the interviews, uh, and they all had the same, uh, uh, you know, kind of view of him that he was a, a humble man, wasn't a braggart, um, very gentlemanly, and um, 
you know, he didn't really talk about his career as a racer, even though he was a world champion. So he's very modest. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's kind of how we, we tried to frame the film. I guess it really is generational. I, I thought it was just all my, uh, uh, my uh, combat veteran um, relatives, you know, from the big one. Uh, who were that modest and never spoke anything. But I guess it really was a, it was a product of his time that, you know, yeah. a gentleman just didn't brag about his accomplishments uh, for the rest of his life. And he was quite an athlete, too. Uh, one of the things his, uh, his step-grandson, um, uh, not D- Doug, talked about was um, he was an athlete his whole life. He had these, um, you know, the kettlebells. You know, he'd have kettlebells and he'd be working out with kettlebells and he had the uh, the wheel that would be on two axes and he'd put it in front of you and he'd roll out and roll back. Uh, he was always a, a fit man. You know, athletics was very important to him his whole life. He was also a three handicap golfer. And uh, I mean, I found all these articles. I found when he got a hole in one out of one of the local. I mean, he, he saved everything. It was great. I, I was impressed with that. I, I'm kind of happy for the man, even though I'll, I'll never meet him, in that it, 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 um, it seemed like he had so many interests and was good at so many things that he's not one of these athletes that falls to pieces and becomes a personal mess because he has nothing yeah. to do once he retires. Was, was yeah. uh, his retirement, was it that much of an adjustment as far as you know? Well, he, his first wife uh, that we talked about in the film Um, she became a ghost halfway through the research. We couldn't find anything on her, no divorce records or anything. And he married this second wife. um, And um, the family told us that he took her to Europe uh, in his later years and gave her the grand tour because he had spent a lot of time in Europe. And they went to some of the, the places in the UK and over in Germany where he had raced and he knew where to go. And you know, he's very international from his travels to Europe uh, and the continent and uh, over to Australia. I mean, he, he traveled for five years around the world and he gave her that treat uh, in his retirement. Um, so I think, you know, he, he was definitely a gentleman his whole life. Mm-hmm. Reminds me a little of the likes of Teddy Roosevelt, you know, you retire out of office and you just see the world and, uh, and yeah. uh, see what's out there. Um, and enjoy, um, you know, the fruits of all all, uh, all your labors, right? Exactly. Uh, how how would you um, now? You're a motorcyclist. You're not a racer, right? Uh, have you ever uh, been involved I'm, in a racing game? Uh, when I was young, I won a competition in a hill climb, and that's it. <laughs> uh, okay. so you wisened up, right? <laughs> yeah, that, I I started riding motorcycles in 1970 when the movie came out called On Any Sunday. If you're a motorcyclist of that era, you know that film. And that film got me and a bunch of my college buddies all interested in motorcycling. And we went out and bought motorcycles. So I've been riding since 1970. I laid off for a couple of decades. And then my current wife, when I met her, she had two motorcycles. She had one motorcycle that was hers. And then she had her older motorcycle she called the boyfriend bike. And I said, I used to ride. And uh, so that was like, uh, fit, almost 20 years ago and uh, got hooked again. And mm-hmm. now we have, we have nine motorcycles between us. So we've become collectors of motorcycles. And, and I'm also a filmmaker. When I retired, I spent 40 years in the high tech industry, 28 of them with Intel. And um, when I retired, I became a filmmaker and uh, made a feature film that won some awards and, uh, then moved on to making films about motorcycles. And I also made a film about a B-17 bomber. And uh, I'm working now on uh, 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 some climbing videos. I used to do a lot of mountaineering. So I'm still in the film film business trying to make, it's all for fun. I mean, I'm lucky. I don't have to you know, grovel and worry about distribution. I'm able to make films because uh, my career was very successful. You know how it goes in this business when you're not desperate, uh, that makes success so much easier. <laughs> yeah, you get to pick. So it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. No, you don't need anybody. Um, and you can keep uh, true to your vision. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll plug your uh, um, how to reach you and all, but uh, your other projects are, are available and uh, our viewers can check those out. Yeah, if you go to vimeo.com slash Thanhauser, my last name. Okay, um, 
Yeah, Vimeo.com slash Sandhouse. There's like 150 some odd films. That oh, are gosh. Available. Yeah. And some of them are short little things. Some of them are, uh, you know, we went to um, Tuscany a couple of years ago and rode motorcycles through Tuscany. And uh, oh. there's a, it's called Tuscany on Two Wheels. We just got back from Germany. We just rode through uh, the Alps in Germany um, last month. And um, I think yeah, I think I put the film up there. There's a five minute cheap hack, I would call it, up there. Uh, kind of highlights, got some footage and anyway. But yeah, I've been, you know, we, it looks like everything I do, I have to make a movie. I don't know. If one of those. <laughs> Spoken like a true filmmaker, right? Uh, uh, what do you currently ride and what's your favorite bike? Um, well, I just rode um, my BMW F800, which is uh, 14 years old. I'm, when I got back from Germany, I said, I'm going to sell it. And I got a new one I just put money down on. Mm -hmm. And then I just picked up today from the shop that was being worked on. I have a 1973 Honda CB350F which is the smallest four-cylinder motorcycle of the Japanese made, 350 cc. So it sounds really good. Doesn't go very fast, but um, yeah. uh, it's a classic. It's a collector item. But when you want to put along nice and, nice and smoothly, right? When you want to turn heads. You know, I go to some of these little, little motorcycle gatherings, and I roll up on that thing, and everybody stops and looks at it. It's great. Mm -hmm. I have an old... Countries. I have an old Suzuki 750. It looks like the bike Steve McQueen jumped the barbed wire with in The oh, Great yeah. Escape. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though it's a Japanese bike, not a BMW, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I got to take the wrench to it and get it running before the nice weather runs out. There you go. Yeah, do it. Get out there. Hey, how would you uh, describe the racing scene? I, I, I was uh, a little disappointed in America that uh, we were a little slow. You know, here we are in, uh, helping to invent flight. And yet we, we shun the, the racing game um, in the early days. Uh, what no, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, um, I think, you know, the franchises like football and baseball really sucked up all the air uh, in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, over in Europe, of course, before we had the soccer craze in Europe, it was motorcycles. I mean, when you had Wembley Stadium with 80,000 people watching these uh, you know, four breast competitions, um, that's where all the excitement was in Europe and same thing down in Australia and that took promoters. And so this guy, Johnny Hoskins, that we mentioned in the book, he was one of the original promoters of uh, this dirt track oval racing. And, uh, it never caught on in the United States. I mean, they, they did board track racing. You saw some footage from board track racing in there down in California. But, um, I think that you know, our Hollywood media did a disservice to the motorcycle community when they came out with films like, you know, The Wild Bunch. And, um, you know, you get this negative impression of anybody who rides a motorcycle and motorcycle events. Uh, or meanwhile, over in Europe, um, we were so amazed. We were riding in Germany for seven days, eight days, and um, there are motorcyclists everywhere. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we we're on the Autobahn for a short period and there were some construction delays and the traffic was stopped. And the cars split apart so we could go between them. We'd lane, lane split. I mean, they, you know, it's normal to have motorcycles uh, working with you in between lanes. Whereas over here in the United States, there's big controversy about this uh, lane sharing activity. Oh God, it's banned uh, in half the states, right? Uh... Yeah, yeah. We And I actually was involved this past year in Oregon trying to get uh, legislation passed to have a lane sharing bill passed. And it got passed by the House and the Senate, put on the governor's desk and she vetoed it because probably someone from the Department of Transportation or somebody blew in her ear and said, if you let this, if you sign this, I'm gonna you know, do something bad. So mm -hmm. I think you know, politics is very political, but you know, in the rest of the world, this lane sharing is, is a normal activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's plenty of road to share, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, how would you uh, describe the, the racing game? Uh, I, I know his speed record for one lap was uh, 36 miles an hour. Uh, like how, 36 how, seconds, yeah. Yeah. It was 36 seconds for one lap at Wembley, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I got that. Well, um, 
Uh, how how has the ra- uh, the racing game changed? Is it as dangerous now? I mean, the equipment was so much more primitive then. Uh, is, is it as dangerous, even though they're going faster? Well, um, it's much safer now. I mean, if you take a look at the tracks, both in the United States and Europe, where you have road racing, uh, organized activities, um, they had these uh, crash areas already planned out where if you go down, you're going to go into a big sand pit, gravel pit. So you're not going to hit a wall. When you're over there in Wembley going in those oval tracks, you know, you hit the wall, you're in big trouble back in the 30s. Uh, This idea of going in ovals is still continues today. It's called Speedway and a very specialized sport, hardly ever here in the United States. It's a very big deal over in Europe, especially up in the the Norwegian countries. But um, uh, the sport's gotten a lot safer. Uh, the tracks are much more well-groomed. That was one of the issues in the articles that, that we uh, focused on, is that the condition of the tracks, and you saw it in some of the video, very bumpy. And, you know, they didn't have any safety on the outs. If you hit the wall, it was just like, you know, you're just dead. Yeah. Now Nobody was sue in those days, right? Yeah. And now nowadays, uh, they have airbags and everything on the walls and everything. Air fence, they call it. Yeah. Boy. No, yeah, it, it says a, a real testament to the man. I mean, I remember I grew up in the evil Knievel era. I know he's yep. a stuntman, not, not a racer, but I remember uh, a journalist listed all of his injuries and then said, <laughs> why would anybody in their right mind do this? Would you have any regrets? And, and he looked at the journalist uh, and, like he was out of his mind. Like, what are you yeah. kidding? This is my life here. This is, yeah. I would never give this up. Yeah, he was a hero to kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I guess my final question, because uh, uh, we're watching the clock here, uh, it would be uh, if you did have the opportunity to meet him, um, uh, what would you ask him? Um, I would ask him about the thrill of riding with people that he became friends with. I mean, you saw in there that group photo, you know, with Dickie Case and uh, all these other guys that he did. He, he they had a, a close bond. It wasn't like they're at each other's throat when they were off the track. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd like to know what those relationships were like. And, you know, they, they were, they dressed to the nines and they were gentlemen, the whole cadre. And I'd like to know more about what it was like living in that 1930s era, um, you know, pre-World War II, because it was, uh, uh, had to be just an amazing time. Yeah, they seem like uh, a lot of respect there. Reminds me a little of boxers, the way they talk about when they're out of the ring. Um, yeah, respect. And I'm sure they had a damn good time when uh, they were off the track, too. So, Well, you saw his girlfriends. I mean, it's interesting. Those pictures of the girls are, were in the last page of his scrapbook that he had put in there. And um, uh, I, he was a player. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad the missus allowed uh, that little piece of history to be saved, you know? <laughs> yeah. We all got, we all got lucky there uh, for the insight. Uh, but uh, Ned, I, I am absolutely, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a history buff myself. I, I imagine you are too. I, I am looking forward, especially to the B-17 film, but it sounds like you've got a lot more material to share with everybody. And one more sure. time, the plug for your channel, please. So everybody can tune Yeah, on, on Vimeo, it's vimeo.com slash Thanhauser, that's T-H-A-N-H-O-U-S-E-R. And you'll find that. Plus, I'm on Facebook. If you Google Thanhauser, um, you'll find more than you want to know. Excellent, excellent. And we look forward to hearing more about the success of this film and uh, others. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing this. I really, really enjoyed it. Well, you know, my saying is, is the best gift that you can give to a filmmaker is an audience. So thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes, most welcome, most welcome. Till next time. Okay, you bet. Cheers.